Bibles in this city, didn't we? <laughs> well, no, we're all looking forward to the game on Saturday. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on Melbourne. I hear and witnessed last year's grand final was pretty impressive over at Optus Stadium in Perth, put on a great show. Wasn't it good that a Victorian team happened to win that premiership? So all things going well, we might have a team from New South Wales get up on Saturday. Now nah, it's good to be back. It's great to be back in Melbourne. Thank you so much for your support. Um, it's been since October 2019 that Vertical Events has held a conference in this great state and at this great hotel. And it's interesting because Stuart Pru and myself, as we wandered into the Grand Hyatt late last night, we thought, who would have thought between 2015 and 2019 we held 13 events in this great hotel in this great city? And then it all came to an abrupt end. And there was that period of time between 2020 and 21 where you, every, there was so much uncertainty. Were we ever going to get back to the great city and the great hotel? But it's really good to be here. It's great to see so many people and we really appreciate your support. We hope that you are set for a, a good day. There's, we've got 26 companies presenting over the day. So plenty of in, information to digest. And because it's hands down the best hotel that we use on the circuit of conferences. We, we decided to go with the green themed color because we're all about green metals. We're all about the lithium, we're at the rare earths, we've got the nickel, we've got the copper. And it's a really exciting time. This city, this state is known for its very strong preferences towards the green political parties. So that's why we're all up and about and excited to be in Melbourne for this conference. So um, welcome to New World Medals, Melbourne leg. And we'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank the Prime Minister of Australia. You know, there's better things I'd like to do on a Sunday morning than find out that the whole country is going to be on a public holiday on the 22nd of September. And again, we really appreciate your flexibility and the fact that you were able to accommodate the change of date. Um, just be patient with some of our presenters. They put on a great show yesterday in Sydney, so they may be a little fatigued. They had to put a lot of trust into that really reliable um, airline called Qantas. But luckily, they made their way on that long journey between Melbourne and Sydney, so it's good to be here. But these events don't exist if you don't have sponsors, as we all know. And later on today, to close out the day, we'll have the great Eddie Rigg from Argonaut on the stage definitely uh, would um, encourage you all to hang around for Eddie. He's uh, highly entertaining. He's one of the best corporate stockbrokers going around in Australia, and it's great to have him on the roadshow with us. So thanks to Argonaut. Uh, CRU, we're just about to get on the stage once Chrissy and I finish. Um, they'll provide a great outlook about the supply and demand situation for these really critical and important metals such as lithium and copper and nickel and rare earths and all the, the great things are gonna go into electric cars. Thanks to the Lynn partners, uh, great supporters of ours based in New York. And now that we can fly around this great planet, we'll hopefully catch up with those guys sometime soon. Atomic Group, a lot of you would be shareholders of different companies. They run the best share registry going around. So I'm sure you've had a lot of correspondence from the Atomic Group. And then we move into our media partners, Resources Roadhouse. You'll see Wally roaming around. You'll see Dave Tasker from Chapter One. Thanks to Jed for the live streaming that's going on at the moment. And now Stockhead. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, but last Thursday in the Australian newspaper, we had a lift out, the New World Medals lift out. I'm not sure if anyone saw a copy of it. Extremely well received. It featured 16 of the companies that are participating today. So uh, that was a great initiative by Stockhead and um, we're looking forward to other partnerships moving forward. So that's it from me. Thanks again, guys, for all your support. I'll pass you on to Chrissy. She'll do the welcome to country. Well, there's the, you know, we're extremely lucky to have, you know, to be in this great country and, you know, we acknowledge the traditional owners and can't wait to see some of them. They just perform the best on the big stage, don't they? You know, like when you see some of those outstanding footballers from the Aboriginal communities and, Typically, you know, they're the ones that win the Norm Smith medals because they always perform when it matters. So great to have to be here in, a, in Melbourne and pass you on to Chrissy and enjoy the day. Thanks, Jackson.
you get the impression that he's slightly AFL obsessed, wouldn't you? Huh? I remember I was working with the ABC in Western Australia and we did a big um, special on the AFL and we spoke to a number of Aboriginal elders and they were talking about the uh, the actual development of the game of AFL and how they used to play a game very similar to it all those years back with a, a kangaroo skin wrapped around bits and pieces and their bare feet up there in the red dirt in the north of our state. It was really, really interesting. Right. I think Jackson is pretty much covered off on everything. So my role then today is as Madam Lash. So I'll be keeping all these wonderful presenters, guys and girls, would you put your hands up, please, up the back there? We've got a number of our presenters up the back. So my job is to keep them in time because, as Jackson mentioned, we have got 26 presenters, so a pretty tight program, and we've got our, our break for morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea. And afterwards, I'm just checking with the great man down the back, our Stewie, as he closes the door. I believe he's putting drinks on for us. So I will double check that. But let's just go with his providing drinks for us at the end of the day. He's got us here a day early. So we'll be able to sit down and we'll be able to chat with our presenters and talk a little bit about what's going on. Now, I'm also very conscious that uh, the audio in our room can be a bit challenging with the sound bouncing off. Is anyone finding that at the moment? You're all okay, or you can't hear me, so it doesn't matter. That's possibly right as well. I mean, the great news is, of course, that all of our pres presentations today will be available on the Vertical Events website. So we've got a new YouTube channel there. So give um, Shane and the team about a day, and that'll all be um, clipped off, and we'll be putting them on there so you can catch up with them a little bit later on. Uh, and a number of our guys too, the Vanadium guys, et cetera, they've actually got QR codes at their desk. So you can click on those and you can download the presentation as well at the completion of today. Right, rules of engagement. Every talk is 15 minutes long. At 10 minutes, I will be ringing my bell, which has somehow disappeared off my desk. And I'm hoping that Qantas actually managed to make that appear here in Melbourne because it didn't appear in Sydney for me. So at the 10 minute mark, I will ring my bell once. That will give our presenters a five minute Morning. I'll ring it again with two minutes to go. I'll stand up with one minute to go. And then, you know, the drill boys, I will then stand very close to you, but not close enough that I get into the ASX live feed. And then I'll pop you off the off the edge of the stage as we go. Um, I'm just looking in the audience and there's a couple of you that I recognize who have actually come all the way over. You're Melbourne based, I know, but you've come to Perth to our last conference there and you've followed us back here. So you really liked the advice that we gave you over there, didn't we? Yeah, good. It's a shame you couldn't get over that border last year because that's when we had Pilbara medals on last year. Did anyone invest in Pilbara medals about this time last year? Anyone at all? None of you. That's a shame, isn't it? Because you'd be hosting the drinks after today and not Stewie because you'd be making an absolute killing. But who knows where the next bit of investment potential is because as Jackson pointed out, it, with that lift out that we put into the paper um, last week, I think it was, the, the chance to educate yourself. And I know that there are a number of you here, um, Roman, who are part of investor groups, et cetera. So you sit there and you educate yourself. And today, of course, is a chance to hear from the horse's mouth, as it were. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, very remiss of us not to welcome you into the room as well. Hello. We know that you'll be missing out on the opportunity to actually speak to our presenters as the day goes on, but each and every single one of them have put their contact details onto their presentation as well. And you are more than welcome, they encourage to get hold of them and speak to them personally as well. But for all of us in the room, we get to go and have a chat with them. And who knows what those drinks at the end of the day might just let them reveal as we go on. Right, are you ready? Enough chatting for the lady down the front. All right, so Jackson mentioned the great uh, Argonaut and Mr. Eddie Wick. Well, today, setting the scene for today's conference and giving our opening address, which is a bit of a novelty for him because he's usually our, our hard closer for our New World Medals Conference, uh, is CRU's Alex Tonks. And he's highlighting some of the opportunities, the medium to term outlooks for New World Medals. And he's got a bit of a foot in all camps. He trained originally as a mining engineer. Then he went into chartered financial analyst. He's also spent 13 years in banking in the resources and commodity sectors. And for the last 10, he's actually been with our co corporate sponsor, CRU. Taking the first 15 minutes and listening for the bell at 10, would you please make welcome our opening speaker, Alex Tonks. 
Thanks very much, Chrissy. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to open the conference today. I'm going to attempt to put in context um, some of the, the scale of the opportunities uh, on offer for Australia from many of the companies you're going to hear from today. I'm going to talk on three things. First is sort of EV demand and decarbonisation and, and those pathways. Um, just as a commodity analyst, we haven't traditionally had to really think about uh, reaching net zero targets and, and how they're going to be achieved. We've generally looked at population growth and GDP growth and FAI growth. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. The second is Australia's export demand shifts um, and how that will change as a result of some of those global trends. And then the third is the potential for Australia to move downstream and add value to some of these commodities. So firstly, just by way of introduction, what does uh, CIU do and who are we? Uh, it stands for Commodity Research Unit. We've been going for over 50 years. Uh, we've got about 400 analysts globally, um, mostly focused on specific commodity groups. So about 35 people, for example, covering our, our aluminium, um, steel, et cetera. Um, we also have a consulting division, which I sit in, um, and much of the material today comes from both analysis and consulting. Um, the consulting side, we typically support many of the companies you're going to see today through the pathway um, from project to development, um, and our uh, expertise are really on the market side, um, and that's where we um, support companies, but we also work with uh, um, a variety of producers, consumers, banks, and also governments around the world. So just to set the scene, this is sort of a heat map of the commodities that, that we cover. Um, and what you can what you can see is it's a pretty abnormal environment. Normally, when we do this, it's far more balanced. Um, this is last year's average price versus the full year forecast for this year. Not much of a forecast left. But what you can see is that almost every commodity that we cover, and I should say that we only cover uh, commodities that are dug out of the ground. We don't cover oil and gas. Um, we cover bulk commodities, base metals and fertilizers. And what you can see is that nearly all of those commodities um, are exceptionally high levels. It's a pretty abnormal environment. Um, now, it's not just the war in Ukraine and some of the supply side disruptions. We have had a pretty substantial demand side shock from very loose monetary policy globally over the last couple of years. And that's really the reason why nearly all commodities are firing. But I'd like to talk on sort of, um, I guess, three themes that are uh, more longer term in, in nature. Um, the first one I'd, I'd highlight is that geopolitics is playing a much greater role in the metals markets. Um, uh, base metals, battery metals, um, and bulk commodities. Um, previously, uh, as a commodity analyst, you really haven't had to think about those things. They've been really isolated to the energy complex, but they are now playing a much, much greater role, obviously, with uh, trade bans on various commodities, and also China's dominance in processing, particularly of a lot of the new world um, commodities that you're going to hear about today. Um, obviously, energy transition is going to place a great deal of stress on some of those commodities, um, you know, for example, silicon and polysilicon processing, some of the legislation that the US has brought in and the EU has now followed, uh, will mean that the, those industries are going to have to relocate from a processing perspective very, very quickly. We're going to run out of polysilicon for solar panels. Uh, and obviously, the transmission of all of these renewables and, and the impacts on the grid are going to be very, very substantial. And of course, that's very copper intensive. It's also aluminium and steel intensive as well. So looking at a periodic table of the commodities that we cover um, and the commodities that are required to really support a low carbon future and a move away from coal, oil and gas, um, you can see the commodities in red, uh, which are actually already in short supply. Uh, and they're already um, in, in markets, what we call in stress. And they're, they're quite small markets um, and they're really struggling already um, really as it relates to either um, geological constraints or processing risks. So copper, nickel, cobalt, rare earths, or, and lithium are all at, all at risk. They really have very limited chances for substitution. And as I mentioned, supply constraints um, already in place. So turning now to decarbonisation, um, one of the challenges when doing long-term forecasting is that you know, many countries have set net zero targets in 2050, China net zero 2060, India 2070, um, but how they achieve those and the pathway to those is not particularly clear. Um, so we obviously run multiple different scenarios to um, think about how those things are gonna change. But really one of the points I'd make here is that um, none of those targets and none of the policy announcements uh, really talk about any form of demand destruction. 
And so the supply side and, and many of the commodities that you're going to hear about today are going to have to uh, keep up in some way, shape or form, and that's going to require some pretty hefty investments. If we look at decarbonisation, though, one of the, th the things that we've done and put a bit of work into is trying to uh, look at uh, the cost of abatement. And these are carbon abatement curves just for Europe and uh, China. Um, so the size of the block represents the emissions reduction. The vertical component is the CO2 incentive price effectively. So they're constructed based on estimates of upfront capex, technology conversion costs, opex costs relative to traditional um, technology. The first point I'd make is that really the fact that the curve is positive means that uh, there will be a cost to reduce carbon emissions, obviously. Second is that really the, um, the right-hand side of both of those curves are things like hydrogen-based DRI. Um, reducing emissions from sectors like steel production are very, very, very expensive to do um, based on current technologies. And why we did this is to get some sense of, um, I guess, preferences and costs associated with transition. And what you can see that on the left-hand side is that obviously decarbonizing the grid generally is the lowest cost option. EVs are pretty closely in, in second. They're a little bit more expensive in Europe than China, somewhat obviously. Um, but really things like solar and wind, which are enormously metals intensive, are at the bottom of the carbon abatement curve. So we don't know exactly the transition that's going to occur over the next couple of decades, but we do know these are some of the cheapest options as it stands today, uh, and they are very, very metals intensive. So what does that mean for Australia? Um, well, if we take those forecasts through just over the next decade, clearly Australia is um, going to have an impact because us exports are obviously dominated by LNG, iron ore, thermal coal and met coal. What you can see on the right-hand side of the commodities we cover and forecast, the forecast and the outlook for seaborne trade for all of those is either flat in the case of iron ore or slightly negative. I would add, though, that that flat to slightly negative demand profile does not mean that new mines in those commodities won't be required. Clearly, mine life decay is an issue, particularly in coal, uh, and new mines will have to be bought on. Australia has a low-cost position in all of those commodities and also a high-quality position, which means mines here are probably required more so than anywhere else. But clearly on the left-hand side is where the opportunity is. Um, you know, we have very, very strong demand outlook for lithium, cobalt, nickel, rare earths, and vanadium. But just putting that into sort of a global context here. So we have the size of the global market in the bubble uh, and then the, the growth rate. And clearly um, the very, very big markets like thermal coal um, are shrinking, but they're enormous. Um, Whereas the, the smaller markets like lithium, um, cobalt, et cetera, are growing extremely high rates, but they're still pretty small. And even in 2030, assuming those very high growth rates, they remain pretty small. On the right-hand side, we have Australia's exports in terms of value today and in 2030. Now, what you see is obviously it's absolutely dominated by iron ore, um, but in 2030, we have a substantial correction there. That is not volume, that is price. So we do expect iron ore to revert to long-term prices, which will have a terms of impact, a terms of trade impact for Australia. Now, to offset that, obviously, there is an opportunity in lithium and uh, nickel and vanadium, et cetera, with the, the great many projects we have here and the, the fantastic resource base. But really, even if we bring on all of those by 2030, you can see the scale of impact. It's still pretty small. To offset any terms of trade shock from iron ore, you're going to have to value add, and I'll talk to that. So just looking a little bit more detail around the demand side, um, clearly in the case of lithium, and, and there are parallels here to rare earths as well, we have a very similar demand profile in rare earths to lithium. But on the lithium side, um, what I would say is that um, I think we are at the the inflection point, clearly EVs drive this. EVs account for about 84% of all demand growth in lithium. Um, EV sales last year were up 50% globally. They're up 93% this year. I think importantly, we're, we're seeing sales take off in markets like the US, which have got much longer distances. Um, and I, I, the other thing I think is that you're seeing um, from large automotive manufacturers, much, much greater options in terms of drivetrains um, over the next couple of years. So we do expect... Uh, the uptake to continue. There are some nuances just in terms of that lithium demand profile though. Clearly um, LFP has got um, great market share in the last couple of years. It's likely to retain that market share overall. 
And that's simply because China and India are probably going to have a preference for LFP being a lower cost battery, um, slightly lower energy density, but we'll, we'll retain um, pretty strong market share in those, those markets. Whereas markets like the US and Europe, which are probably going to pay a premium for higher energy density batteries, such as the NMC811, we think that battery will gain share throughout the forecast. And that's really why on the right-hand side, we have hydroxide demand outstripping carbonate demand towards the back end of the forecast. That's a great opportunity for the Australian miners because spodger means a uh, much quicker and easy pathway through to hydroxide. Um, and clearly the Australian miners know this. There's been a fantastic supply side response from Australia, given the resources here. I don't also add we're quite substantially underexplored for lithium in this country. So I expect these numbers to continue to go up, but nonetheless, we've seen a great response on the mine side. Uh, Spodumene production up 85% first this time last year. Really though, I think the key question is though, that can we value add to that? Australia um, really does have a, a very dominant position in lithium, but we also have a very substantial position in nickel, cobalt, rare earths and vanadium, and all of those present the opportunity to add value. Now, Australia has typically shied away from downstream processing, and that's been pretty logical in bulk commodities because the margins associated with steel are very, very fine. Globally, the steel industry or any returns in EBITDA are about 5%. Uh, very, very flat cost curves, not particularly attractive. But we do think there is an opportunity to add value in these commodities in Australia. If we look at spodumene in Australia, um, we the country dominates the bottom half of the global cost curve in spodumene production. Australia is extremely competitive at digging it out of the ground. Um, but we're also competitive in hydroxide. And this is why we think we should see more and more hydroxide production out of this country, because uh, I think it's a, a misconception that we're not good at processing. Um, clearly, in the case of hydroxide, we're at the bottom of the curve. There's a few higher cost operations that are in ramp up that can come down. Now, if we look at um, that very same hydroxide cost curve um, here that I previously showed versus demand in 2030, you can get a sense of the scale of the opportunity. So this isolates carbonate out of the story for now, um, but, and it is on a um, carbonate equivalent basis. But what you can see is that cost curve for hydroxide production today is going to have to expand uh, dramatically over the last seven years, over the next seven years to keep up with that demand. And profile that's pretty unusual you know when you're forecasting most commodities you have a demand overlay that you can actually see on the cost curve and typically it's around the 90th percentile so you know there is a very very big opportunity for australia to um participate in that that hydroxide demand profile uh, and add value if you look on the right hand side at our spodumene exports and this is all spodumene potential exports in 2030 if we export only spodumene, it's only going to be a few billion tons, a few billion dollars a year as an industry. Um, whereas if we can turn that into hydroxide, you end up with an industry a little shy of $10 billion. But if you can then go further and process, process that potentially into cathode precursor materials, um, or potentially, just for the, the, the case here, into an NMC811, you end up with an industry roughly the size of or about $30 billion, which is about the same size as Australia's Met Coal exports today. So there is a, a meaningful um, opportunity there. So just to wrap up, yeah, Australia does have a very, very big opportunity in front of it. Um, we are gonna have to add value to really offset any uh, terms of trade shock from, from bulk commodities. Um, the, the level of vertical integration you'll see between things like lithium, nickel, vanadium, et cetera, is gonna vary. Um, depending on economics. We think generally that the economics will be supported by lowering power costs in the country and thinking about um, reducing reductant and reagent costs as well, which, is, which can be quite high here. Now, clearly geopolitics has been driving regionalization of supply chains in, in both Europe and the US, um, but we do think there is an investment case behind this as well. Thanks very much. Happy to take any questions. Alec, thank you so much for that. That was a really interesting way to start the presentation. And usually when um, Alec's doing his thing at the end of our conferences, I'm running around like a mad thing. So really good to sit down and actually take some of that information. A lot of what ifs there, isn't there? What if, what if we, what if we do these things? And you can chat to Alec, uh, he and who, one of your colleagues is here with you sitting over the side there. Um, have a chat with them during the day too and get their take on it and Let's see if they've got any advice, sound advice for you. Thank you so much for coming and being part of New World Medals today. Would you please thank our first speaker today, Alex Thomas.
Uh, showing us where that opportunity lies for growth. So potential areas for investment for you. Let's get started with some of our explorers and our producers. St. George Mining is the first to take to the stage today. They've got an exciting portfolio of projects over in Western Australia, and they're very much focused on future-facing metals, uh, multiple future-facing metals, in fact, including its flagship Mount Alexander project, where high-grade nickel copper sulfides have already been discovered over a strike, which is more than five kilometres long. And this gentleman is their executive chairman. Would you please welcome John Pranaeus uh, here to present the St George story for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to be back in Melbourne to present to shareholders and investors. It's been a while. Uh, just a quick one pager on uh, supply and demand uh, dynamics in the clean energy space. Some of you may have seen this announcement by Benchmark Mineral Intelligence last week. They said you need about 300 plus mines to deliver the uh, supply that we need for clean energy metals over the next 10 years. Um, I've just picked out the lithium and nickel there. So you can see huge uh, demand increase up to 2035, uh, just reflecting the, the multi-decade transition to electrification. This is an unstoppable train. It's going to happen. It's happening. And it's going to grow exponentially. Um, so I think it was about 60 new mines required for lithium and about 50 for nickel. So that's a huge, huge demand. Uh, you just can't turn on the tap and get this supply. How do you get this supply response? Uh, when well, you need to have exploration and development, and the only way to get that is to have a high enough price of those commodities to incentivize investment. Goldman Sachs issued a report last week and nailed it. They said you need about $150 billion of investment in copper projects to get to the net zero targets. And that requires the copper price to be up at about US $13,000 a tonne. It's currently at about 7,000 or so. So you can see great increase still required uh, to get to that incentive price. Without that, you know, it's just not gonna get the um, investment uh, to deliver the commodity. Same supply and demand thematic is going to play out across the clean energy metals. Uh, the nickel price you've probably observed is, is really triggered up a little bit this year. It's up at about $11 a pound, which is a great price, but it could go a lot higher. So that's a great scenario for St. George, a great opportunity for all uh, developers and explorers to create great profits for uh, their shareholders. Uh, at St. George, we've got four projects uh, focused on clean energy metals, Mount Alexander. We've had our nickel, copper, and PGE discoveries. And just last week, we started announcing our lithium potential there, which is growing very, very fast. And I'll fill you in on that soon. Our Patterson project up in the Patterson province, uh, about 40 kilometers away from with Winu discovery by Rio Tinto, uh, copper gold potential there. Um, the Ajana project is near Geraldton in Western Australia. That's an early stage project, but a large scale nickel, copper, PGE target, and similarly a broad view uh, along the same belt that hosts Charles's Julemar discovery, about 100 kilometers south of that, also prospective for nickel copper PGEs, all in Western Australia. A quick snapshot of our corporate, uh, the two key things on this slide are our market capitalization, we're just $25 million, so that's pretty low compared to where we could be if we deliver on some of these exploration opportunities. Our neighbors on the lithium front at uh, Mount Alexander are red dirt metals. They're already at $200 million market cap. So you can see the potential rise if we continue to deliver on our exploration. The other great point to take from this slide is our technical team. We're in exploration, so you need very good technical people. Uh, Julian Hanna joined us earlier this year. Most of you would probably know him from Western areas where he made the great discoveries at Forestania and turned that company into leading nickel producer. Uh, Charles Wilkinson. Uh, was also a chief geologist level at uh, Western Areas, and prior to that was the head of nickel exploration at Western Mining. Western Mining made most of the nickel discoveries in, in Western Australia back in the day. And Dave Mahone is our young bull uh, who handles all the field work. So we've got a great team, track record of discoveries, and hopefully we can start delivering. Matt Alexander, our flagship project, excellent address in the middle of the Yilgarn Craton established mining region. So we're not in the Victoria desert where you have to spend $300 million on infrastructure to get going. We're close to uh, BHP and IGO's uh, main nickel projects up there, the Leinster and the Cosmos project. Uh, and lithium just to the south of us is the Red Dirt uh, Mount Ida project. So great neurology arguments, but also great geology and great uh, infrastructure to keep going. The nickel copper sulfides we've discovered at Mount Alexander, 
uh, as Chrissy said, uh, on a 5.5 kilometer strike. Unfortunately, they're not continuous, but they are high grade and they are shallow. They're relatively small, so we're still drilling them out to see exactly how big they are. But the big prize is trying to find the, the bigger deposit at depth. Uh, we have done some metallurgical test work. We used XPS, uh, a Glencore subsidiary in Canada. They are very experienced at the similar style of mineralization we have, the nickel, copper, and PGEs. It's not a common uh, blend in Australia, mostly plain nickel mineralization. So we've gone to Canada. Uh, we've proven that we can create commercially attractive concentrates through simple flotation process. So that's a big tick for our project. Separate nickel, separate copper concentrates, but also very strong credits for PGEs, cobalt, gold, and silver. That's just a sample of our intersections. So very thick, high-grade intersections. Uh, they do speak to the potential economic um, potential out there. We just got to find more. We've rolled out some new geophysics, electromagnetic surveys and seismic surveys. These are the go-to tools for trying to find this nickel at depth. Uh, the EM will light up the conductive sulfides at depth. Uh, the seismic survey will map the structures that host those um, uh, potential deposits. So some promising targets identified. Uh, the most promising is in the granite greenstone contact. Uh, if some of you are familiar with back the T5 discovery of Flying Fox, Forestania, that was on the granite greenstone contact, a nice deposit about underneath about 500 meters of granite. We've uh, come up with a similar target at uh, Mount Alexander. So we've got a, a late time EM conductor. So it's a very strong conductor, about 320 meters below granite. It's about uh, 200 by 150 meters at the moment. Uh, but right next to it, a little bit deeper, is a large seismic reflector. So there's some different kind of rock down there to the granite. It's giving off this reflective signal. Hopefully it's more nickel sulfides. We're going to do some fixed loop EM over it just to firm up the modeling of these targets and then go and drill them. Uh, hopefully we'll be drilling by the end of October. So they're really great targets for a potential new nickel discovery of scale. Last week we did start announcing our lithium potential. So this is really, really exciting. Um, Red Dirt announced uh, back in September last year that did nickel discoveries and called it the new, new lithium province. So you can see there down at the bottom there, uh, southeast from us. And uh, typically with pegmatite hosted lithium, you're talking about a corridor adjacent to a granite. The granites are usually what uh, have been the source of the pegmatites. So the copper field granite on the uh, eastern side there is what we believe has been the source of these uh, lithium bearing pegmatites. It's certainly what uh, Red Dead has been saying. And we're following this uh, corridor all the way up to our ground. And that's where our focus of exploration has been. We're not the only ones exploring out there with uh, red dirt, Zenith Minerals, uh, in joint venture with uh, a large UK-based EV metals PLCs out there, and Hawthorne Resources, uh, just to the south of us, is also having a look out there with Hancock Prospecting, Gina Reinhardt. So some real big names coming into the area. The first thing we have to do to find the lithium is field mapping and rock chip sampling. So far, we think we're finding lithium lithium bearing pegmatites, we think they've got spodumene and lipidolite. Spodumene is lithium silicate, lipidolite is lithium mica. So the visual observations are telling us that they're there. Uh, quite a large strike length. So, so far, 1.7 kilometers, these east-west trending pegmatite dikes, we're finding these lithium bearing pegmatites in there. So great early success. Uh, we've collected hundreds of uh, samples that will be uh, assayed and also be tested some by the spectrometer, XRD spectrometer, they can tell you straight away whether you've got spodumene or the pitolite or one of the other lithium bearing um, metals. So we'll have the first announcements on that uh, next week. We announced just today we had these beautiful rocks. Uh, next week we'll have our first results. We're also doing soil sampling on the east of that tenement. So all that uh, dotted grid that you can see, that's got a little bit of thin cover there. So you can't see the outcrop. Typically you see the pegmatite outcrop at surface. That's got a bit of cover, but it's right smack bang in the middle of this uh, perfect corridor for pegmatite. So we're doing some soil surveys over there to see if there's something underneath the surface. So the exploration for lithium is gathering, gathering pace. Uh, these are samples collected. So this purpley stuff you see is uh, either lipidite or spodumene. The creamier stuff, the top left-hand corner, is probably the spodumene uh, and the darker purple, the lipidolite. So uh, we need this, the, the assays and the, the XRD analysis to confirm, but we're feeling pretty confident we're finding lithium bearing pegmatites. Uh, hopefully next week when we confirm it with the analysis, we'll get an even bigger re-rate on our share price. 
So keep watching the lithium space because I think that one's pretty easy to develop. Uh, the Patterson project, as I mentioned, up in the Patterson province, uh, we've done our first round of diamond drilling up there. We're in a great address, uh, Rio and its joint ventures are with SIPA and Antipa right next door to us. So everyone's watching what we're going to come up with. Uh, early results look good. We've certainly confirmed hydrothermal alteration, uh, right lithologies with sulfides uh, and brecciation in the drill core. We're waiting for assays, so we'll see what they come back with. Should be starting to get those in the next week or two. They're a little bit delayed, but all assays are delayed in WA at the moment. The Agena project is up in Geraldton, uh, just off Northampton. I think the Brownlow medalist was up from that region. Um, uh, this is an established mineral field, lots of base metal mines that were discovered from outcrops. So the old timers just uh, picked the outcrop, lead, copper, zinc mines. Our area has got about 20 meters of cover, so the old timers just didn't touch that. We've pegged the ground. And we've done some modern geophysics that's showing us it's got the right kind of geophysical signature. We've done some further analysis and we're seeing this really strong magnetic feature, which we interpret to be a mafic intrusion, similar to the mafic intrusions that you see at the Julema and the potential to also host nickel copper sulfide. So we're hoping to get on the ground next quarter on that one as well and start drilling. Finally, the Broadview project, also um, a Julema type uh, lookalike. It's down the southern end of the mobile belt that hosts uh, the Julemar Jul discovery. Uh, it also has a very strong magnetic signature, potentially again, a mafic intrusion, which is prospective nickel copper PG. So these both are early stage projects, but something that come out of left field very quickly with a major discovery. So lots of drilling still to be done this year. Uh, we want to get on the ground and test our lithium targets. We want to get on the ground and test those uh, nickel targets that we talked about. Hopefully by the end of October, we'll be doing that. Uh, we completed the Patterson drilling. Assay is coming very soon now. Uh, and hopefully also doing our maiden drilling at Agena and Broadview. So keep watching us. Uh, great potential to create a lot of value for shareholders. And that's the presentation. Thank you very much. that Julian Hanna is here with me today. So please come around and have a chat to us. Uh, he'll give you a better technical summation than I have. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joel. Well done. And you're in time too. You're on fire today. Well done. We will get to morning tea even earlier. And we'll also get more time, more importantly, to speak to all of our presenters. I want you to imagine a homegrown corridor of mine to metal to building batteries right here in Australia because that is the plan for our next presentation. Richmond Vanadium is looking to play its part in that story. This man coming up the front is Managing Director Dr. Sean Wren, and after his presentation, you can have a chat with him about his PhD, which is in economic geology. He's a gun in exploration, in project assessment and feasibility, and if he is on board with a project, there is a very good reason. Please make him welcome. Thank you. And uh, how do I draw the slides? You got me slides. Yeah. This one. There you go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this this one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, just uh, great to have this opportunity here uh, talking about the vanadium. And uh, <coughs> vanadium uh, is uh, one of the most beautiful metal, probably. And uh, the color there just showing you the different oxidation state of the Vanadium, you know, five plus, four plus, three plus, and two plus. Um, everybody's seen the, you know, we have seen the growth in the lithium once we do the lithium batteries driving the vehicle evolution for the energy transition. But just like you imagine, you know, the nice state once we done the uh, vehicles, you done your cars, then what are we going to do? to decarbonize our power grid and the industrial complex and your city power supplies. And uh, vanadium is probably the next solution for this very large scale, long life energy storage battery demand. So uh, we're lucky in Australia there, and I'll just walk you through a wonderful uh, world-class vanadium project in North Queensland. Um, it's a very large deposit. You will miss the uh, excitement in the exploration phase when people are announcing discoveries and good insections. But this one, we already got a reserve. 
uh, it's one of the critical mineral, one of the only critical mineral project in North Queensland that get declared as a coordinated project by the Queensland government. Uh, if you don't understand, uh, you don't know that's uh, what you have is in Queensland. If you have the coordinated project status, uh, the coordinated general's office uh, set up a team to work uh, the company through all the EIS approval process. Uh, it's got a very large resource and they're actually a, a reserve developed and uh, it's a 460 million ton reserve. And uh, apart from the oil industry, and I have not seen a project with that sort of reserve before you start production. Uh, this is a massive scale uh, for the project. And then we work through, uh, we've done all the flow sheet and methodology and everything uh, come out with um, very, very good result. Um, as I said, you know, it's a very large resource space. We get 1.8 billion ton resource. Uh, we use the cutoff grade 0.3%. This is the oxide vanadium resource. We use the 0.3 cutoff. Uh, most of the other projects of similar projects, similar geology, and their average grade will, upon three will be above their average grade. Most of the people will have probably about a uh, between 0.2 and 0.3%, which we have used 0.3 cutoff uh, because we got, the, um, uh, you know, we're lucky in a sense, you know, we are the high grade part of the system. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's actually coordinated project status is the highest uh, approval status by Queensland government. Uh, the project also hitting the major project the declaration by the federal government. Uh, Location-wise, it's uh, actually in a nice place uh, between Tansfer and the Montaiza. You know, you got the existing sort of rail and the highway and all the supply chain uh, to supply the Montaiza sort of mining center. Uh, so it's halfway. The green in the middle there is our tenement. Uh, it's about a 400, uh, 1,400 square case. Uh, what uh, you have for the jewelry sense is uh, this is a marine sediments. Uh, you know, weather it and uh, come to the surface, weather that become and have your supergene enrichment, uh, get a uh, firm this uh, large water class uh, oxide of an project. Uh, did a close up, and uh, on the left is the tenement, it's about 1400 uh, square case. Uh, people ask me about uh, the irregular shape of the tenement, what the, the tenement that follows uh, is the Tula Bark formation where it comes to the surface, to get exposed to the surface. And the weather, uh, this is a supergene like, uh, like a bauxite, more mineral sand type sort of deposit. Uh, on the right hand side, you have the resource figures there and uh, you can see uh, Rosebury is our largest, probably 1.2 billion tons. Uh, that one, we haven't uh, done the close up uh, to make it an indicated category yet. So the grid looks a bit low, but uh, uh, the highest grid in section actually is in the Rosebury uh, deposit. We get a uh, individual drill house get a grid to about 1%. Uh, but the little well is where we focused on. That's uh, 430 million tons uh, indicated. Uh, that one firm the, is our focus in stage one. And uh, that one, uh, provided the bulk of the essentially all the current reserve. Um, it's a very extremely simple geology. It's a bit boring in the, you know, from my geology background, this is very boring geology. So it's just get about a few meters of a lower cover on top. Uh, it's very, very flat country down here is the cattle country and uh, the flood plains occasionally you get a little bit of cover. So the probably, you know, seven ish meters you know, from zero to seven ish meters. Then below the cover, you get this uh, oxide. That's the width to the back. And uh, uh, so that cross section got a horizontal compression 10 times. So that, uh, you know, that width of the cross section is about, you know, four kilometers, three and a half, four kilometers. Uh, you can see the consistency of the deposit and uh, the consistency of the grade distribution. Uh, so mining will be all free digging, uh, extremely easy. You just strip uh, the top off, then you get into your body. And um, uh, the grid is, uh, is, is really good and consistent. And it's open all the directions. And actually the deposits will link all the way to Rosbury. 
uh, if you get all the sort of uh, area, the tenement uh, drilled out, you probably find deposit, you know, in the order of 50 or the kilometers in strike lines. Uh, we, uh, you know, we do, it's uh, easy to process as well because it's oxide and uh, we have done our metal testing, you know, from uh, uh, half percent sort of resource grade. And once we do the processing, uh, we get to uh, concentrate about 1.8%. Uh, for vanadium, actually 1.8% concentrate is actually the second highest grade concentrate uh, uh, we know, and in South Africa, in the bushfield, they do produce uh, a slightly higher concentrate, but they are the hard rock titanomagnetite compared we are the, you know, like this is weather, the very soft rock. Uh, we did uh, the uh, mine planning design as well. So the stage one uh, open pit will have about 172 million tons with a very low stripping ratio of 0.9. And uh, the entire sort of life of the Lilyville deposit itself got a 460 million tons uh, reserve and uh, with the stripping ratio just a touch over one. Uh, so this uh, just, uh, you, you know, essentially it's like um, sequential mining operation like people in the bauxite or in the mineral sand industry. You just uh, open up one area and the stripping back fill as you progress. Uh, so the site get progressively, you know, um, rehabilitated as the mining progress from one side of the deposit to the other. Uh, I didn't mention, you know, the, the, the deepest part of the open pit is only 24 meters. So it's uh, um, uh, atypical from, you know, a hard rock mining operation where, you know, you have a small area, but you dig it down very deep with high stripping ratios. Uh, we spend, uh, because it's oxide, we spend uh, four years, four and a half years optimizing the processing line and how to process uh, this, you know, this material is soft, easy, easy to mine. What's the best way to process that? And uh, most of the vanadium project, you need, uh, you know, like it's quite a, uh, intensive processing, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, when you get your one, one point something percent concentrate, you have to roast and all that. Uh, but because this is oxide and uh, we sort of, you know, we get, we're lucky really, you know, it's easy to process. We do a, a screen classification probably in the pit and then we take that fine friction uh, to a plant, to a processing facility. We do a flotation there. Then we produce the concentrate together to about 1.8% uh, V205. Uh, we have run um, three sort of, you know, rounds of MET test. And, uh, you know, the first round that you use about 30 to 50 kilogram size. The last batch we run on a 200 kilogram uh, sample size with uh, three batch. We always run three batches of the same sample size uh, to make sure it's consistent, everything there. Yeah. Uh, as I sort of mentioned, you know, it's the same part, you know, that's the simplicity. Uh, give us because soft we don't need to drill and blast we don't need to mill we just go mining directly to concentrate to the to produce the concentrate then in the refining phase to produce uh, vanadium uh, pentoxide battery grade uh, we don't need roasting most of the vanadium projects need roasting particularly the tetramectan need roasting we don't need roasting we just go directly acid leaching and then we purify the thing to a uh, sort of um, non eight point six percent flake uh, this uh, simplicity uh, translated in, into extremely attractive financial terms, uh, very low capex and uh, low opex, and uh, that you know obviously lead to a better you know return on your investment. Uh, I need to uh, sort of probably clarify that the uh, capex there, and uh, when we did the PFS, uh, we compared the options of refining onshore and refining offshore, takes country the offshore. So that 242 is actually based on uh, like local processing to concentrate and offshore sort of refining. And uh, then the onshore option in transfer, you know, will add, a, you know, the refinery will add a, a capex, add on about sort of a hundred million dollars more capex. But uh, off, partly offset of that is the port allocation about, you know, close to 30 million dollars we need to do at the port when we export the concentrate. 
if we're doing onshore refining, we don't need to do that. So we will save about, so the net gap is about $70 million. And we're confident that we'll get um, uh, quite a good support from government to, uh, to bridge that gap. So this gives you a summary, the left-hand side of the sample of the, um, of the ore, and it's actually very soft. You have to hold it uh, very carefully because otherwise you crush it in your hand. So that's, uh, that's why it's so easy. We use the, you know, PFS, we use conservative, uh, uh, you know, parameters, get a good, uh, get a good outcome. Yeah, getting there, yeah. Uh, we use 10%, yeah, discount. Uh, this one, we just uh, give you a sort of, you know, to uh, put you into the perspective of how to compare that to the, you know, to the best and the good uh, tender magnet project. So we produce the better concentrated in the mining, and then that's leading to a simple sort of, you know, return on that. Our input, the mining grade is lower, but the concentrate grade is higher. So this is uh, the, the sort of a dream we're talking about. And uh, we are chairman Brandon uh, Graves there. He's a regional minister in WA for many years. And, uh, you know, bridge the gap with the government, all the communications. You know, this, uh, the Australian government being talking about the local processing, value adding, as our pre previous speaker was talking about. Uh, the Vanadium battery industry is actually a rather short industrial sort of chain. So once we get to a battery grade uh, vanadium pentoxide, next stage is battery making. Uh, we get a partner, an optic partner, and the, like uh, industry partner in WA called the UPS. They're actually producing batteries uh, for remote side at the moment, but they're importing all the electrolyte. So we are uh, in partnership with develop that industry through that corridor. So we have uh, end product uh, in Australia. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ren. Excuse me, there's some gremlins seems to have gotten into my computer, but I can tell you at this point in time that the Dreadnought team are coming out to have a chat with us. It was my own problem. Thank you, Dr. Ren, and please have a chat with him afterwards, everyone. Um, I was looking for these guys' stocks, which is me being naughty in my computer, because I was thinking to myself, when they presented uh, with us back in 2019, wasn't it, Dean Tuck? 2019, there were these eager mob of guys that, and girls that came up and they were so passionate about what they were doing. And I really believed in it. And I thought, I need to get on board here. And I think it was two cents. And then I see what it is today. And I think it's 12 cents. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. So could there be a potential in here for yourselves and uh, your investment portfolio? Let's hear Dean Tuck and see what his um, guys and girls out there are coming up with to solve the future metals problems of our world. Thank you. Please make him welcome. Yes. Thank you, Chrissy, and, and thank you for everyone who's shown up today. I believe this is Dreadnought's first time to be in Melbourne, so very, very excited. Uh, too bad I'm not staying around for the grand final, but there's no WA teams in this year, unfortunately. So uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us online as well. Uh, if you're not tired of listening to me yet, I feel like it's been death by presentation, but uh, it's been fantastic traveling around with RAU and, and Stu, Peru, and crew, and, and really look forward to uh, speaking to everyone today and our existing and, and future shareholders back at our back at our booth. So I'll get this uh, thing majigger to, to work somewhere. Oh, oh, got it. There we go. All right. So, so Dreadnought Resources, uh, it's been a very exciting uh, journey for us so far for the last three years, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, you know, Dreadnought Resources, we started off in April 2019. We were a, a three to five mil market cap with, with big dreams and ambitions of, of becoming a, a fantastic explorer and, and discovery company. Uh, we had these visions. We'd seen the model before us. You know, you see great exploration success, like your Julemars, your Noah Bollingers, your Hemis, uh, your Gruyers, all of these discoveries made in frontier provinces that have been unloved or unexplored for whatever reason. This is usually where your, your big elephant opportunities are, and that's always been our arm-wavy dream. And for the last three years, uh, we've built a company led by a fantastic board uh, in order to deliver returns to shareholders through discovery. And uh, we've been well on that path. And when we talk about shareholders, you know, board and management, we've invested over three, uh, $3.3 .3 million of our own cash and money over the last three years. We own over 15% of the company. We are strongly aligned with shareholders. We are here to deliver value. All options are on the table for whatever discoveries we have made and will continue to make. In 2019, we got started. 
Uh, we had a flagship project up in the Kimberley, unexplored since 1978, off limits, I should say, the 1978, uh, unexplored since Rory Woodall himself in 1958. It was a fantastic opportunity. I've been in Myanmar and the Amazon jungle and all sorts of wonderful places that dumb geos go and get covered in flies and bitten by animals. And um, here was a tier one opportunity in a tier one province uh, to actually make a discovery on unexplored land in Western Australia, an opportunity like that just doesn't exist. Um, and we also added in 2019 our Alara project, which we acquired off Newmont. 2020, we made our initial gold discovery, actually a rediscovery, Metzke's find, uh, putting the first first uh, you know feather in the cap. 2020, we added the Mangaroon project to our portfolio. And in 2021, we made our, our uh, discovery up in the Kimberley, high-grade copper cobalt style of mineralization not seen before in Western Australia, similar to Clunk Curry, Tin and Creek, a very exciting. We see that as an Evanco opportunity evolving for us. And then this year, the team has continued to deliver. And we've made one, two already with hopefully more on the way, rare earth discoveries at our Mangaroon project and our joint venture with First Quantum. And so that's been three years so far, probably the hardest working teams on the ASX. We put out uh, an announcement every one to two weeks on the market to keep our shareholders informed of what we're doing with their money. And we put 85% of that money on average into the ground. because That's the only way you make a discovery. Last quarter was 95% of the money into the ground. And that's, of course, when we started making our, our major discoveries. So we have an exciting company. We have an exciting team. As uh, Liam Neeson says, you know, we've developed a special set of skills over our careers. And that skill set has allowed us to make discoveries, and we will continue to do so. Let's talk about Mangaroon. This is what has driven us from a from a uh, hundred mil market cap in the back of the copper gold discoveries to the three to four hundred mil market cap that we are today. We acquired over five thousand or four and a half thousand square kilometers of ground. We've since consolidated that to about five thousand three hundred square kilometers of ground in the Gascoigne region, unloved for lots of historical regions, which I'm more than happy to talk about over beer later on, on Stu's account, and. Um, Regardless, we, we, we identify these high-grade, uh, high tenor, I should say, high tenor bloody sulfides uh, discovered by the Pashless in the 1960s, uh, pretty much unrecognized by the mining industry. Uh, we're quite close relationships with our pastoralists and our, and our native title holders out there. So we have uh, a little bit of insight to the history of these areas that mining companies often overlook. And we quickly had First Quantum show an interest in that because they think there's an eagle-style opportunity, a high tenor, high-grade nickel, copper, PGE, uh, massive sulfide, uh, similar age rocks as Jin Chuan. So they came in very early on. They just exercised their option. They now have to spend 12 mil to earn 51%. They own 0% of the project to date. And we're free carried to a decision to mine, at which point they get 70%. First nine holes, uh, first 12 holes we drilled a couple of months ago, nine of those hit mineralization, confirming the system's fertile. First quantum continues to be encouraged, and, and, and we're very happy that they're uh, leading the technical charge and, and the financial charge on that. But moving on to the, the main story, once we got that nickel uh, off, off and running with first quantum, our young geos, uh, Luke Blaze, Ross Chandler, Nick Chapman, all on site, we've done the nickel, and they've gone all, oh, we're next door to Hastings. Uh, perhaps we have the iron stone sticking across the Lions River Fault, and up until this stage in time, the Lions River Fault was considered the southern extent of the uh, the, the Gifford Creek ferrocarbonatite complex. And those of us involved with exploration for long periods of time often know the mineralization does not stop at the fault; it continues across the other side. So we saw an opportunity very early on to perhaps have the second half of Hastings and Gabbana operation. This is the next rare earth mine coming into development in Western Australia. Wailu Group Twiggy just got involved with this one. It's a very exciting region, some of the highest NDPR ratios uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a very high value product. And then after that, after confirming that we had found or potentially the other half of the uh, the Hastings operation, we also believe that we have the source carbonatite intrusions for that region, which not only gives us the opportunity to have a, a, the other half of Hastings, but to have something similar to Mountain Pass or Linus. And this would significantly be an upscale opportunity for this region and for Dreadnought and our shareholders. So we talk about the, the carbonatites and rare earths, we saw a large scale opportunity. But as I said before, we've made gold discoveries, copper, copper cobalt discoveries, we're an exploration team. And we wanted to make sure that the rare earths were worthwhile going into before we went out there and allocated our time and resources to it. Thankfully, second mover advantage with Hastings being next door doing such great work over the last 15 years, their metallurgy, their flow sheets had all been identified and, and developed over the last 15 years. So before we even drilled a hole into the rare earth uh, carbonatites, or sorry, the uh, ironstone dikes, we collected 
the 80 kilos of rock, hiked it out two and a half kilometers to our vehicles, took it down to ALS and put it through the exact same flotation sheet that Hastings had developed. And before we even drilled a hole, we had confirmed that we could produce a high grade monazite concentrate with very high NDPR. With that box ticked, we knew that we had something, a real opportunity here. And what we're seeing here at this map is the 30 years of exploration on the uh, on the uh, iron stones at Yangabana. Number of deposits, they have about 27 million tons at around 1% uh, rare earths. Uh, focusing Bald Hill, Simon's Find, and Fraser. Simon's Find has some of the highest NDPR ratios in the world. Uh, you look at Mountain Pass in California and uh, Mount Weld Linuses, you're looking at 15 to 25 percent neodymium, praseodymium in that total rare earth oxide content. When you look at something like Simon's Find or the average Yangabana, that's 40 to 57 percent. That means a handful of concentrate from these Yangabana iron stones is worth two to three to four times as much as a handful of concentrate from another rare earth mine. Uh, it's a very, very uh, unique and very fantastic opportunity in the rare earth space for Western Australia and Australia in general. So, uh, oh, sorry, wrong thing with your button. All right. So the iron stones down here on our part of the tenure, uh, 12 months ago, none of these existed. So June 2021 is when we announced the yen iron stone. We announced it on the back of discovering it and confirming the mineralization there. Before that, we didn't talk about the rare earths. We wanted to make sure it was real. We've now um, identified the yen trend over 16 strike kilometers. We've uh, drilled out three of those. We're delivering a, a resource on that by the end of the year. Last week, we delivered the Sabre discovery, another couple kilometers of ironstone, Y8. We're drilling at the moment. And by the end of the week, we should be drilling, or start of next week, we should be drilling our carbonatite targets. And again, yen, Sabre, Y8, and the rest of these ironstones have the potential to be the other half of Hastings. The gabonatites have the potential to be a completely different step change opportunity for us. And we're not just arm waving, those pads are prepped, that drilling is going to start imminently. So drilling started at yin. Why did it start at yin? It outcropped quite significantly. So we could we could uh, we could trace it. We knew where it was going. We had a good idea of where it was, so that if we did find something significant there, we could turn around and deliver a resource on that very quickly and deliver a maiden resource before the end of the year. So from June this year, we announced our discovery, June, July, at Yin, and within six weeks, uh, we had already drilled out the three kilometers of that for, for a maiden drilled resource. So we have 41 holes of that back from the lab. As soon as the other uh, 80 holes are delivered, we will have Lynn Windebar put out that resource. We should deliver that in the December quarter. It's important to note that when we went into this area, there's always been about, you know, we could be the next Hastings. The Hastings Yangabana Ironstones average two to three meters thickness. The best drill intercept they've had in 14, 15 years of drilling was 24 meters at 1.8% total rare earths. Our first drill holes, we got over 30 meters at 3%. So not only are we evolving to be the second half of Hastings, we've also seen thicker and higher grade intercepts than has ever been intercepted in this region to date. Very, very exciting opportunity, and it certainly lit a, a fire under us. And we've drilled that over three kilometers, and we've continued to see thick mineralized rare earth intercepts over that three kilometers open a long strike for 16 kilometers, which we'll be drilling hopefully by the end of the year as well. Parallel loads, lots of opportunities to continue to uh, see resource upside. Saber discovery, again, additional resource opportunity. We're drilling now down at Y8. We'll update the market on that here shortly as we commence drilling at the Gabonatites as well. So we have uh, a very significant drill program underway. We're about to commence a very uh, exciting for us. I get goosebumps thinking about it. The C1 to C5 drill program, 99.98% of these carbonatites are undercover. Uh, in a few spots where they did stick out of the ground, we've confirmed that they are mineralized. We have rock chips uh, grading rare earths. We know they're carbonatites. We know they're mineralized, but we don't know how big they are or where it is within those intrusions. Mm -hmm. And you look at world-class carbonatite hosted deposits, they're not huge. They're not Hemi. They're not Julemar. They're not uh, billions of tons that take 14 rigs in, in a year and a half to drill out. Uh, Mountain Pass was 30 million tons at 8%, uh, Mount Weld, 50 million tons at 5%. So that fits in the footprint around 700 by 150 meters in the case of Mountain Pass. Our first pass drilling out here is 160 by 160 meters grid spacing. That's to test the entirety of these carbonatites to find out where within them the mineralization is. So that program is designed for one to three holes to tap into a world-class deposit, at which point all approvals are in place to quickly turn around and to deliver that resource drill out by the end of this year. So if we are lucky enough to have a world-class deposit sitting there within the carbonatites, we'll have that drill out by the end of the year and the resource is out to the market by mid next year. Tip of the iceberg, there's a lot more opportunity. But I wanna make clear as well that we're not gonna be an exploration company that just continues to drill and build up resources 
sources for no good reason. We know that a world-class deposit is 30 to 50 million tons. We know that Hastings has developed their mine and their, and their feasibility studies were 30. So we are going to get to that critical threshold and start delivering our studies to show that this thing is developable and economic. So once we deliver our resources up here, and once we know what we have, the carbonatites and the rare the iron stones, we will then start scoping study research, uh, scoping study work while just seeing the tip of the iceberg of the opportunity in the region. The nickel I already spoke upon, uh, high tenor sulfides, very exciting to see. Uh, it's an exploration geo, there's something better than seeing sulfides and gossams, uh, especially in Western Australia. So there'll be a lot of work continuing on that in the background. I'll touch quickly on Taraji Yampi up in the Kimberley. This is what we uh, listed on. Uh, we see an Ivanko style opportunity here uh, with these high grade copper and cobalt discovery at Orion that we made last year. Now uh, we were planning to move up there now, but with the rare earths in front of us and we can see a number of discoveries and resources that we can deliver, we will build that pipeline at Taraji Yampi. Then when we go into the orphan period on the rare earths and we start doing the scoping studies, we'll take the team and the rigs up to the Kimberley and have a full pipeline of high quality and robust copper cobalt uh, targets to hopefully make additional discoveries and start delivering our resources up in the Kimberley. We already have six Orion lookalikes. We cracked the code as we continue to evolve our understanding. The regolith profile is quite thin. We thought it was going to be 20, 30 meters thick. It was one to five. We developed with Ozex a heli portable auger program. We kicked that off early this year. We've already found six geochemical similarity uh, targets to Orion, some of them with EM conductors sitting there ready to be drilled, some of them with Gossens on them, uh, high grade, again, copper, silver, gold, and cobalt. So we have a, a very, we're going to build a very exciting pipeline. We have two auger rigs starting up here soon, and uh, we'll be building that pipeline for us going forward. So catalyst for dreadnoughts, we have a lot of outstanding drill holes, a lot of assays coming in from the lab. We'll deliver, hopefully, additional discoveries. Regardless, we have resources coming up by the end of this year. And we will have our main garoon news flow being funded by First Quantum. And we have a pipeline being developed at in, in the Kimberley, which will deliver us, hopefully, discovery and resource targets for next year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. And for those of you who wonder why, just I want to let you know why I don't immediately thank or walk over to him at the end. We're recording, as I said, all of these presentations today, not just for you, but of course also for the ASX. And they don't want my head anywhere in their presentation. So I just stay over here. So I'm not being rude. I'm just waiting three or four beats so we can edit the point and then we can go in. Right. Oh, and for those of you who have just joined us, we do have seats at the front. So please don't feel like you have to stand at the back. We want to watch you as you come through the audience. Come and sit down. There's some seats at the front here. Plenty for everyone. Right. Iron Ore Limited, next up on our program. They are the owner of the Rylart Ridge Lithium Boron Project, which is located in Nevada, USA. And that is the only known deposit of its kind, lithium boron deposit in North America. And it's actually only one of two such deposits uh, in the world. So when you look at that, it's expected that it will globally become a very significant long life source of lithium and boron. And in September 2021, so about this time 12 months ago, they entered into a very nice little 50-50 joint venture to advance that project. Then you got a nice little signed uptake agreement, tick that one, and they've managed to keep control of the project as well. So it all sounds really exciting, lots of upside. Would you please welcome CFO Ian Bucknell to join us with all the details. Thanks everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not actually the CFO, Ian Bucknell. My name's Jason Mack, I'm the Investor Relations. Ian was unable to make it because of the change in date, so you're stuck with me for the next 15 minutes. Um, usual disclaimer. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a corporate overview, talk about the Rylite Ridge project, uh, and touch on the lithium and boron markets for a bit of context, uh, recent achievements, next steps, and if Chrissy hasn't kicked me off the stage, I'll provide a little summary. So capital structure, we have 2.1 billion shares on issue, a $1.4 billion market cap, uh, and that we have $136 million in cash at the end of the last financial year. That'll take us through to a final investment decision. Have a strong shareholder base, top 50 holding 65% of the register. Our joint venture partner, Sabanio Stillwater, with 7%, and uh, strong institutional holders, 24%. Highly capable team. James Calloway, our chairman, is the former chairman of Oricobre and one of the few people who can say that he's developing his second lithium mine. Alan Bernard Rowe is uh, the MD and 
a long history of exploration in Nevada where our project is and instrumental in identifying the unique opportunity of Rylight Ridge and bringing that to the company. Alan Davies, uh, Chief Executive Energy and Minerals of Rio Tinto in his former life, including the head of the Borax division, which is important for us. Uh, Rose McKinney James, ESG Sustainability Governance, Maggie Walker, um, the a chemical engineer in construction and development as well. And our most recent appointment, appointment Stephen Gardner, uh, 40 years corporate finance. So a really complementary mix of skills and experience to deliver a development. We've got the right people, but we've also got the right partners. We've spent like 115 million US to do, on this project so far. And all the while we've uh, sought tier one partners to, to do the work for us. Uh, Fleur led our DFS work and is now the EPCM on the project. Uh, we just uh, announced a deal with CAT and finalised the agreement for an automated haulage system. Cometco doing the pilot plant work. So anyone looking under the bonnet here and having a deep dive is, is um, seeing the quality work done and that's vindicating, vindicated in you know, Sabane Stillwater committing 409 million US to the project development and we're in the uh, advanced stage due diligence of the Department of Energy for US government debt. The Rylight Ridge project is located on federal land in Esmeralda County in Nevada, tier one mining jurisdiction. Um, it's, uh, you can see in the middle there, we're located about halfway between Reno and Las Vegas, uh, 25 kilometers west of the only producing lithium mine in the, in the US. It is a unique deposit. It's lithium and boron hosted in sealer sites, a sedimentary deposit, relatively young in geological terms, about uh, 5 million years old. Um, and uh, it, we're, so the DFS as well was completed in April 20, 2020. Um, so we will update those numbers and the CapEx number you can expect will probably lift. Um, but uh, all in sustaining cash costs, 2,500 tonnes US per tonne, so it puts us in the lowest quartile has a resource of 146.5 million tonnes, and that includes a 60 million tonne ore reserve that's going to support our initial 26-year mine life. Um, plenty of upside from that larger resource base as well. It is the most advanced lithium project in the US on, on a number of fronts. Permitting, we have there's three key pro, uh, permits we require. We have two of those, and we're working uh, in advanced stages on the final permit. We have binding offtakes for both our boron and lithium. Uh, and on the funding side, we've got the equity side pretty much sorted with our joint venture partner there. And we're working on the US government debt, as I mentioned. Heaps of engineering works done, full simulation pilot plant that's produced all three of our products, uh, the lithium hydroxide, carbonate and boric acid. And we continue to work on the engineering to be uh, construction ready in line with permitting. Our project design has been uh, really centred around our commitment to sustainability. Uh, it's, we're going to have an acid plant on site that will produce all of the power for our, for our project. And, and, uh, so, and then we've got low water usage. A lot of the water is getting recycled through the processing facility. This is, uh, this is not a brine or a spodumene. So we, had, we don't have any evaporation ponds and no tailing stamps, so they're smaller mine footprint. And our commitment to sustainability is really... Uh, visible through our ongoing commitment to the protection and conservation of Teams buckwheat, which is a, a, an endangered rare wildflower that's on the on the property, um, and we're implementing a an award-winning ESG program to ensure that we have accountability of our operation and transparency in our reporting. So, just on the lithium uh, markets, global lithium trends. Everybody, we've already heard about that today, so I won't touch on it too much. But lithium, strong growth, electric vehicles and a short supply with long lead times on new, new supply. If we look more closely at the, the US market, uh, it's heavily dependent on foreign supply. And so Rylight Ridge is really well placed to, to uh, serve that, that supply chain or growing supply chain. And we're starting to see a real shift from the, in the Biden administration on, um, on trying to develop that domestic supply. They implemented the Inflation Reduction Act recently and uh, some tax credits on electric vehicles with uh, uh, domestically sourced materials. Uh, so you can see the number of uh, gigafactories proposed or being built at the moment in the US. And um, that's gonna require a, a massive demand of lithium, over 300,000 tonnes. They currently 
domestic production of 5,000 tonnes per annum, lifting to around 122,000 tonnes per annum by the middle of the decade. So um, really uh, still heavily reliant on the foreign supply. So we're in a great, great location to deliver to that. Uh, boron may be a little less, uh, little less familiar, but you see on the left, there's a wagon wheel there of all the end, end uses, or lots of essential end uses, and a fairly even spread. Um, seeing increasing demand in, in agriculture, especially glass and, and the permanent magnets and electric vehicles, also getting used. It's a lightweight strengthening for steel, so that's, that's helpful in the uh, car manufacturing as well. It's a, it's a well-developed global market, dominated by two, two companies, Eddie Madden in Turkey and Rio in California, with about 80% of the refined borates market. And the stable pricing over many decades is, is useful for us as a, as a co-product. We've placed all our boric acid offtake uh, for the initial stages of the project. And so that's, uh, that's really just to help us with our uh, funding on the debt side of things. And here's just a couple of excerpts to uh, demonstrate how boron's becoming essential in the production of electric vehicles. So recent achievements, uh, we recently listed on the NASDAQ on the 30th of June and uh, celebrated with a closing of bell, closing bell ringing. Um, it's, it's an ADR2 listing, which means we didn't issue any capital or raise any, sorry, raise any capital or issue any shares. Um, but really we've got a strategic asset in the US and an increasing shareholder base there. So it made sense to increase the market profile. Lithium off tapes. Completed this strategy now. We recently announced two offtake agreements. Um, we signed, they're all binding, and we signed with Ford uh, 7,000 tonnes per annum and PPES, which is Toyota and Panasonic joint venture. So the focus here has really been about delivering to that US electric vehicle market. Um, and all the terms that we've, we've used is to support our funding initiatives. Next step. So these are our key work streams, project uh, funding, the engineering and the permitting. On the funding side, I mentioned we're fully funded to final, final investment decision. On the equity side, we have Sabanio Stillwater, our joint venture partner, we're committing the 490 million US. And uh, we're, we're working with the joint venture partner to secure the, the debt side of things that we're hopeful we'll get that through the US Department of Energy and we're hoping to be able to make an announcement on that fairly soon in the next month or so. But all the while, we're still progressing uh, discussions on other funding alternatives on the debt side just to ensure that you know, we have all bases covered. Um, uh, yeah, so, and Goldman Sachs is helping us with all of that. Engineering, we have, uh, we're progressing this all the while, while we get everything else in line, the permitting and the, and the funding. Uh, majority of our key contracts have been awarded and we're progressing it, we're, at, we're ahead of schedule, but really we just want to decrease our execution risk. And that's, so we're trying to align that with the, with the final permitting, make sure we're ready to go when we, we get the go ahead. On the permitting side, I mentioned we have, there's three key projects. We have two of those. We have the air quality and the water pollution control permits and the final air environmental impact statement. We've just submitted, resubmitted our plan of operation. So we shifted the, uh, we shifted the pit to avoid the buckwheat uh, on, the, on, the, on site. And we're hoping to have a publication of a notice of intent very shortly. And that really kickstarts what's called the NEPA process, the permitting process goes through some public scoping meetings, draft the uh, draft uh, environmental impact statement, and then finally a record of decision. So we can move into a final investment decision. So key milestones, couple there completed, the, the listing of NASDAQ, lithium offtakes, and our resubmission of the plan of operations. Hoping to get that notice of intent very shortly to kickstart that process uh, for, the, for the permitting and finalizing the debt all the while completing our engineering design work so we can be ready for a final investment decision. But the project timing is, is definitely all relating to the permitting. So to wrap it up, why iron ear? We've got the right commodities, new world metals, uh, right location to serve that US electric vehicle supply chain, um, great team, proven track record of development. We've got some near-term news flow there with the debt and the permitting and then a clear path to production. 
thanks very much and come by the booth and say hi. Can I ask you a quick question? Or can you tell these guys a quick question? Where, answer, where do you live? Tell them where we live. I live in Dunsborough in WA. Okay, what's it like down in Dunsborough in WA? It has its moments. It's near the Margaret River wine region. It's yeah. surf, beach. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Horrible, isn't it? Just yeah. horrible. So are you coming to our Buskerton Southwest Connect conference in October? Yeah, well, I was there last year and I yeah. look forward to attending again this year. So I need to sell it to all of you guys because now there is a, the, the direct um, flight from Melbourne, yep, yeah. straight into Busselton, which is uh, 25 minutes from, well, well, the is where the conference is, 25 yeah. minutes from where I live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's great. So if you'd like to come down and join us, you'll see this fellow down there and you'll see a lot of um, great other West Australian presenters down there. And it is a direct flight and Dunsborough is absolutely Beautiful. Thank you so much. And I have my apologies for calling you Ian. Far better looking than Ian. Radio. Right <laughs> We're going to stay in the West now. Now with our next presenter to the Midwest of Western Australia, where the 100% owned Murchison Technology Metals Project is charging ahead. The project comprises the Gabonintha and Yarrabubba vanadium deposits, which is one of the highest grade vanadium deposits in the world. Technology Metals Australia's CEO is David Ingram. And he's joined us up on stage today to talk about the implementation plans for the Murchison Technology Metals Project and also their plans for 2023 and beyond. Please make him welcome. Thanks very much, Chrissy, and thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Today, I'd like to uh, give an overview of who we are, our, our purpose, um, the project, the Murchison Technology Metals Project and uh, the journey that we're going through and the journey that we have in front of us. So there's our disclaimer. Please refer to our website for all our presentations, tmtlimited.com.au. And we have got the booth out there today. We look forward to talking to you out there. In terms of the corporate overview, um, you know, we, we have got a 210 shares on issue. Market cap is 75 million. We'll let you make judgment of that. Our shareholding is very strongly held. We've got the top 20 is 56.7% uh, of the shares. And in fact, uh, the top four shareholders, 39.1% of our shareholders. I make note of our recent shareholder, RCF, who joined us November last year with uh, an injection of $13.8 million into the business, which has been very handy in terms of progressing the project. In terms of our board, um, we are progressing and building a project. With that, we need to build the board and the, uh, the executive team, and in fact, the whole team to progress the project. Michael Fry is our chairman. He's been involved with the project since listing in 2017. Ian Prentice, our managing director, he was also with us when we listed in 2017. And Son Wu, who's currently our company secretary, he was also one of the founding directors. With uh, RCF joining us, Jacqueline Murray has joined our board. Um, and of recent, four, six weeks ago, Dr. Carmen Letton has joined our board. So we are increasing the strength of our board. In terms of myself, I joined the company at the commencement of the DFS and have been with the project through to today. Uh, Alicia, our Chief Financial Officer, she's just come out of FNG, joined us about four weeks ago as our CFO, and John McDougall, who's our exploration manager, he's been involved with the project right from the very start and has provided that continuity in terms of geological investigations and resource development. Our purpose, we are here to support the net zero movement. We see vanadium as a very key to the greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And we see that being two things that contribute towards that. Vanadium is used in steel. About 90% of vanadium currently is used in steel. And the more vanadium you put into the steel, the higher the tensile strength and the less steel you need to use. If you look at 250 MPA steel to 350 MPA steel to 450 MPA steel, well, that means you produce less steel to do the same task if you use the higher MPA, higher content vanadium steels. The, the movement in the market, 
is, is certainly towards the vanadium redox flow batteries. We're not talking about the batteries in our, in our phones and in the cars, the lithium batteries. We're talking about the vanadium redox flow batteries, which are really designed for large static uh, grid support systems. And we'll talk a bit about that today. When we talk about our purpose, certainly the ESG is front of mind to us. Uh, we are very focused um, right from the start of this project on ESG. Um, we work. We are going to be 25 year mine life. So we are going to offer real generational opportunity for the community um, and business in the local, the local business. We have a focus on obviously the European history, but most significantly the indigenous history there, the Yunganai people and the opportunity that it provides to them in terms of individuals, but also indigenous business. We have a strong focus on energy efficiency and water efficiency and water efficiency in particular is significant in this part of the country where we're developing, but also very significant to the indigenous community. The renewable energy drive requires long duration storage battery systems. And I guess there's an evolution of thinking with that. And, um, and, and that will continue, especially when we look at the extensive targets that we're looking to achieve by 2050 in terms of net zero emissions, but also some of the aggressive targets that have been set for 2030 in terms of emissions reductions. And they are big challenges in themselves. I'd like to talk about the vanadium redox flow battery and how that's different to the lithium battery. And the vanadium redox battery is the large 100 megawatt plus systems that will support large grid systems as we produce renewables. We need to store them and time shift them. And so the, the vanadium redox flow battery is designed for storing, you know, five beyond five hours, you know, beyond 12 hours, in fact, beyond 20 hours um, in terms of large volumes of power. It is also very, um, um, in, in terms of its number of cycles that it can deal with, it's not sensitive to cycles and doesn't have deterioration as you cycle the battery. And so for large grid systems that need to store energy for longer periods of time and undergo large cycles in charge and release, um, you know, the vanadium redox flow battery is the future. So there's a shift from the steel industry of today in 2021, where 90% of our vanadium is used in steel. And if you build, if we take the numbers that are presented to us, you know, the amount of vanadium that we will need by 2031 is in the order of an additional 150,000 tonnes of V2O5 per annum. And um, I, I refer to, you know, just what's happening in Western Australia, where we're shutting down all, we're shutting down our government supply uh, stations, power stations, well, we need to then be in a position where we have the renewables and we have the long-term storage, charge and release to support that. And so there's definitely going to be a shift from steel to the battery industry as renewables, our reliance on renewables increases. To put that in perspective, our mine will produce, produce between 12,500 tonnes to 14,000 tonnes of V2O5 per annum, and by 2031, we'll be calling for 150,000. Just in, in summary, and uh, in terms of what's happening globally, at the moment, 62% of vanadium is from China, from primary and secondary production, and 16% is out of Russia. And I guess if Australia is, uh, going to be part of this renewable energy solution and the storage required to achieve that, we need to develop our vanadium and have that for use in Australia. So that's our purpose in terms of our project. We are located in central WA. Uh, we are located about 40 kilometres from a town called Megathara. Mikathara is a well-serviced town being on the major highway to the northwest. It is also a, a, a significant airport there and is a centre for the Royal Flying Doctor Service. 
We have good road systems through to Geraldton and to Perth. And we also have the fortune of having a gas supplier line that runs from Geraldton directly east and we'll be interconnecting into that gas pipeline to provide us gas for the process. One of the largest single vanadium projects globally, we have an ore reserve of 44.5 million tonnes at 0.89% V205. We recently finished an integration study which examined another pit, another mine to the south, 23 kilometres, known as Yarrabubba. And Yarrabubba is, is, is within that 44.5 million tonnes at 0.89. But significantly, Yarrabubba also produces a, a byproduct in the form of um, ilmenite. And so we have a maiden reserve from the Yarrabubba deposit of 15.8 million tonnes at 10% ilmenite. Um, we have completed extensive flow sheet development and test work, been working with FLS uh, for the last three and a half years doing test work in Bethlehem, the States. And that's very significant because of the design of the kiln, but also design of, uh, of key operating parameters in terms of conversion in that kiln. As I say, we have a mine life of 25 years. And our reserve case was based on 12,500 tonne per annum, but we're just going through now an optimization process in terms of what is the best mining sequence and what is the production profile to optimize the production profile. Critical advantages, not to dwell on this too much. Um, it is a high quality ore body and we measure quality of the ore body because it is a fresh magnetite and the first um, phase of recovering vanadium is in fact recovering magnetite. The, ma the vanadium is contained within the magnetite. And so if you've got a fresh ore body, you get high magnetic recovery, which is, is essential for um, full recovery of vanadium. We have thick continuous high grade zones, um, 12 to 20 meters, typically those different zones. And we have very little cover. We have uh, a fresh rock outcrop to surface. Um, it's a coarse grain, 250 micron in Gabonitha and 150 micron grind in Yarrabubba to, um, to, to recover the Yormanite. I guess um, this is some of the journey that we've covered. The organisation was floated in 2017, late 2017. We finished the definitive feasibility study in quarter three, 2019. Since 2019, we've been progressing environmental approvals. We started the environmental approval process when we started the DFS and we continue with environmental approvals. And we're now at the final stages in terms of meeting the EPA process. And we hope to have an, a, an outcome from the EPA um, in, uh, in the second half of this year. And that is driving the schedule for the project. We've been working with FLS. We started test work with them in early 2019. We have made a commitment with FLS to commence detailed design of the, of the kiln. The gas pipeline is very significant in terms of the engineering and the approvals for that gas pipeline have commenced. And we're aiming to have a resource upgrade and a reserve upgrade again in the second half of this year. The most significant thing, given that the DFS is 2019, we are updating the financials of the DFS by going out to commercial competitive tendered pricing. And that process started two weeks ago. So the capital cost that we develop for the final, um, final financial model for the de decision to develop uh, in the second half, uh, sorry, the last quarter of this year, will be based on commercial competitive tendered pricing, um, both for capital costs and for operating costs. So we, we're well and truly poised for an implementation phase and an implementation report and a decision to develop at the end of this year. In terms of, we're fully funded to FID. So we're making the decision to develop in December. We're seeking full, uh, final investment decision at the end of March. We have a supportive shareholder group in terms of RCF being 17.2. 
The board, in fact, holds 7.9. And as I said, the top 20 have a significant holding and the top four also a significant. We've got an execution focused team and we're building that team. And we have quality partners working with WA Government, Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, the Australian Government, the CNMNC, which has an offtake agreement, and uh, our key engineers being FL Smith, Orlogy and WAVE. So today I'd like to thank you for your attention and please come and see, if, come and see us at the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darwin, for New Technology Medals Australia. We have one more presentation to go before we are free for a break and we can do a bit of talking about everything that we've heard. Uh, Caspian Resources is taking us out. They've enjoyed some recent success at its Yarrawinda Brook PGE Nickel and Copper project, which is just north of Perth. And it's they've actually opened a second exploration site, haven't you, as well? Certainly have. Mount Squires Gold, Nickel and Copper project. That's in West Musgrave. And to talk to us about it today, would you please welcome CEO, Mr. Greg Miles. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, uh, everybody. Well, thank you, organisers, and thank you, everyone, for coming along and getting an update on the Caspian story, which is actually the first time that I've presented here in Melbourne. Um, so it's great to be here and uh, deliver in the flesh, so to speak. So um, this uh, presentation has been lodged on the ASX. Uh, a quick corporate overview. Caspian came to life uh, in November 2020. Uh, so relatively um, small uh, cap structure. Um, well funded, um, we've got a strong board, uh, and, and I guess unashamedly we are a, um, a base and precious metals company, so, so in the context of this conference, kind of an old school, uh, old world metals, but obviously going to benefit from new world applications, and uh, we are a, an, an exploration company, and um, which is generally where um, most of value is, is derived from it in this industry. So I, when I was uh, thinking about where, where Caspian's at at the moment, I think flying is pretty much what sums it up for us, both figuratively and literally. Uh, we've had some fantastic success of late um, based on an on avalanche of new um, results that have come in, mostly from our Yarrawinda Brook project, which is what... I guess it's our flagship and that's what we'll focus on mostly today. But also uh, now on our Mount Squires project, as Chrissy alluded to, uh, which you know suffered through the whole COVID lockdowns. Uh, we weren't able to do as much work as what, what we would like, but it's a, a fantastic strategic project out in the West Musgrave region of Western Australia. And we'll just touch on that later as well. So Yarrow into Brook, um, I guess it's it's just to carry on the football analogy, it's always great to play in your home ground where you know where the wind blows and which side of the field to play on. And um, so both our projects are located uh, on our home ground in Western Australia. And in fact, when it comes to Yarrowinda Brook, almost in our backyard. Um, so only a short distance up the highway from Perth, only 100, 100 kilometres. And uh, just down the road from uh, Chalice Mining's uh, Julemar project, which is one of the great uh, discoveries of the of the last couple of years, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. We've had the benefit of being a first mover into this into this area. Uh, we've been exploring now for for three years, um, and and I guess are, are following in the footsteps of Charles. And I I guess we've we've demonstrated that we we've got the same uh, body of rocks, and now we I think you'll see that we're also starting to demonstrate the same styles of mineralisation. And that's really about Ceredella. This is um, some results from only the last month. Um, Yark 36, drill hole 36, uh, a breakthrough discovery for, for us at Yarrawinda. Um, 17 metres at a bit over two grams, uh, 4E. Now that's um, a way to abbreviate both platinum, palladium, gold and rhodium, which is something we'll, allude to, we'll expand on shortly. Um, that's supported by some other drill holes um, holds 25 and 22, also in the area, you know, in an area that we're sort of calling Upper Ceredella. Um, 3E is, is platinum, palladium and gold by itself. And so these are um, uh, uh, quite, you know, significant sort of results. And just to put it into context, I've put there 
uh, chalices resource grade, just to give you a sense for what might be economic in, in this these type of deposits, because they, they are kind of difficult to understand. It's polymetallic um, and you get a bit of payability from everything. So uh, the va main value drivers uh, um, are probably the PGEs, platinum and palladium, but there's also a little bit of nickel, a little bit of copper kicking in there as well. And it all adds up uh, into what can be a very profitable operation. Now, now these sort of deposits are relatively um, uncommon in Australia. Uh, PGE deposits are, are probably more common in the Bushveld region of South Africa um, and somewhat in, in Africa, uh, sorry, um, Russia and, and Canada. Um, now I mentioned rhodium. So rhodium's um, an interesting one. You don't hear too much about it. And that's mostly because we've never really explored for it in Australia. Um, but it's, um, you'll hear a lot today about rare earths. Well, I can assure you that rhodium is rarer than all of them. Um, and because of that, it's uh, extremely high value. It's roughly about 10 times gold. And there's a comparative chart there of, of the rhodium price to palladium and gold. Um, and that's um, a real bonus for us at, at uh, Yarrawinda. Um, you know, it wasn't something we were expecting to see, um, it, but it's um, but it's a significant value driver. So because of the value, you don't necessarily need too much to make a significant contribution to your economics. Now, uh, rhodium, it's, it doesn't require any sort of special uh, processing treatment. It's recovered in the same processes that you recover your um, uh, platinum and palladium. So uh, sulfide float, flotation, um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, so there's nothing special that you have to do to treat it. Um, usually used for similar applications that use platinum and palladium for um, at the moment catalytic converters, but um, but also future applications uh, with uh, hydrogen fuel cells and the like. So this is a really exciting development for us. I, I dare say that um, those values there, they're, they're some of the highest recorded, well, I think it's actually the highest uh, recorded rhodium results ever in Australia. So it sets us apart from some of the other PGE players. So that's uh, just a bit of a sense for, for what a uh, you know, drill section, just to sense what the mineralization looks like in, in cross section. Um, in, in hindsight, it was probably pretty obvious that we were gonna get something uh, exciting. There has been some exploration here in the past, back in the seventies and eighties, would you believe? Um, some early exploration in just the shallow uh, weathered zone looking for, for uh, PGEs, but we're the first sort of company to do any sort of basement exploration. And, um, Cerradello actually was a mere uh, concept only 12 months ago, and, and um, now we've, we've demonstrated what, what I believe is an economic discovery. Um, our approach to, to exploring here has been um, really to try and demonstrate scale. So uh, small numbers of holes drilled on really large spacings, uh, commonly 200 metres or greater. And, and it's about trying to understand uh, the, the overall geology uh, of the area and the, and the potential scale. Cerradella itself is about 1.2 kilometres long, open down dip or down plunge, um, it's, which is roughly um, you know, the same sort of scale of intrusion as, as what Chalice have at Gonneville as well. Um, still lots to, lots to go here. Um, you can see there hole 39 is, is a hole that we, we didn't drill deep enough and, that, and extending that hole is one of the key priorities for Caspian in, in its upcoming drill program. But it's not the only target. So one of our targets is obviously following up those, those great drill results, but we've also got another conceptual target about where the better, better mineralization might be. And we believe that for, for those that are geologically minded, the, the basal contact of these intrusions is usually where sulfide mineralization is accumulated. Um, and that would be to the Northeast of where we're currently drilling. We have had some encouragement, the, the three holes there, 40 to 42. Over 100 metres worth of, of mineralised thickness, uh, you know, modest grade at the moment in terms of PGEs. But what we can see in these systems is that the tenor can change quite uh, rapidly over short distances. And, um, you know, it wouldn't take very much for this to be, um, as, we, as we expect the mineralisation to improve close to that basal contact, uh, that this could be a, a discovery of, of, of world scale significance. Um, so that those two sort of targets, if you like, are going to be the focus for the company coming up. We're, um, we're currently working on a Mount Squires project, which I'll, uh, I'll fill you in on in a minute. Um, but come the end of October, we'll be back out at Yarrawinda, and, and that'll be a busy sort of six-month period right through the sort of summer season, 
um, uh, through sort of to the end of April. As you can see, we're working in agricultural sort of land. Um, you know, so we have uh, land access agreements with with some of the farmers uh, out there. Um, they, you know, they're obviously cropping the paddocks and whatnot. Um, it's been an exceptionally wet winter in, in Perth, and um, it's it, quite frankly, it's just too awkward to to move around in paddocks at this time of year. But come the end of October, we can't wait to be back out there and, and drilling again. But it's not the, it's not our only target. There's um, this is really just the start of a long exploration program ahead of us at Yarrawinda. As I said before, we've got the same sort of belt of rocks that extends north uh, of, of Charles' uh, Julemar project right through our project area. So, And there's a range of other targets, soil anomalies and EM anomalies that, that we're yet to explore. So um, a number of exciting targets still to be tested as well. So in the meantime, though, uh, Mount Squires. So out in the West Musgrove region of, of Western Australia, it's not something that uh, a place that most people get to. Um, it really is one of the last frontiers, if you like, of, of um, early stage exploration in, in Australia. And, and I guess it's a strategic land position. We, uh, um, it's almost two projects in one here. We've got sort of a, a copper gold kind of target on the uh, west side of the project and a nickel copper target on the on the east side of the project, which is an extension of the same belt of rocks that host the Nebo Babel uh, deposits that are operated by Oz Minerals. Now this area actually came to light more recently with BHP's uh, bid for, for Oz and the value of that West Musgrave project. Oz Minerals are currently working through a DFS and we're anticipating a financial investment decision on that project soon. Um, fantastic position for us to be in. That project is a, a multi-decade, well, provided it gets uh, developed, is a multi-decade project for nickel and copper, um, and we're right next door. Uh, hardly any exploration for nickel copper on our on our project area. And so that's what we're initiating exploration on at the moment. Uh, we have done our first, our first phase of exploration. Uh, it was on the Duchess Prospect. Sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, Duchess Prospect there on the on the west side of the project area. Uh, there was an interesting sort of multi-element sort of soil anomaly. Uh, like I said, uh, it's a copper gold kind of system. We don't really know what it is, and that's the that's the beauty of going out and exploring on the frontiers. You never quite know what you're going to get. Um, and those of you that are, you know uh, uh, follow exploration histories and uh, of of major discoveries, that's often how it works out. You go exploring for something and find something else. Um, and so this this really could be anything. Um, we've done a first phase of drilling. We're actually mobilizing a drill rig back out there later this month to complete that drilling program. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because there's actually going to be probably more results come out on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but needless to say, um, an about four week reconnaissance air cool program um, and, and a, with the particular focus on that nickel copper trend on the um, eastern side of the project. So, all that comes together for an exciting time for shareholders, I believe. Um, we're still getting results in from our Yarrawinda Brook project um, with some of the peripheral uh, holes around um, Cerradella still come in. Uh, results from the Mount Squires project that, at particularly Duchess, but as well as being active. We're active on the, in the field um, over the next six months. So it's gonna generate a lot of news flow. Um, we've got a strong cash balance. There's a lot to look forward to for our shareholders. So I invite you to come and be part of the Caspian journey. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Chrissy. Great presentation, Mr. Marlis. Thank you very, very much. Nice, strong finish to our first session. So we've had six really interesting uh, presentations. We've had our analysis from Mr. Tonks. Go out and enjoy your morning tea. And I'll be ringing the bell in half an hour. I'll give you about five minutes notice before the start of our next session. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>